Uh, for those who don't know, uh, I always like starting by telling you something you don't know. And oftentimes when I've ever introduced a guest, especially this one today, uh, he in particular is special. We have listening in on this call, the creative team from Braun Studios listening in because there's some work lined up for Jim. I mean, there's a show concept in the making and there's some work he's got to do, which we'll get into what that looks like in a short few minutes. So, so Jim's got to be on his best behavior and he's got to say yes to everything I say because he's, because the light is on him. Everyone give me a double thumbs up. Y'all get what I'm saying. But there's no pressure because this guy's not only bold, but he's beautiful. He's, he's, he's a brainiac, an amazing man. He's made a huge difference. Uh, I mean, when I first met him, was in Montreal, Quebec. And I was in the midst of underwriting and developing Oprah's own network launch. And that's where I met Jim. Right inside of the Oprah camp, I was happy to have hosted him. Uh, he was a delight. Own loved him. Oprah loves him. And in fact, I went on to learn that Will Smith uses him. I mean, cast members of incredible franchises like The Avengers and other superheroes use him. But not just actors, not just Hollywood, but I mean, anybody who wants to make sure that their brain is performing at peak capacity. Jim Quick's the guy they go to. I mean, not only has he published an incredible book, not only is he interviewing himself, incredible thought leaders around the world on the topic of brain science, neuroscience, and biohacking in some way, shape, or form because he really is trying to beat the system called you. I mean, I'm really delighted to have him here. Why don't we give him a warm welcome, Mr. Jim Quick. What's up, big guy? Appreciate it, sir. Thank you, everybody. You doing, That's my man? introduction. Hey, look, dude, it's all downhill from here. That's the way I see it. I mean, I set <laughs> up real here. And I mean, it's, 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 it's crash and burn time. But Jim, first and foremost, I hope you and your bride are safe and well. You look good. You, Thank you. You've been well. Yeah, I hope everyone is is, is strong and sharp as uh, you're sanitized, all that good stuff. Well, that's why we do this, by the way, because it's a, it's a completely COVID-friendly environment. It's all digital, one-dimensional, but it feels four-dimensional. So, uh, so we're glad that you're safe and you're well. So first and foremost, let's start here. Who would you say is Jim? Who's Jim Quick? Who are you? How would you best describe yourself? Who is Jim Quick? Well, Quick really is my last name. I didn't change it to do what I do, but the name like Quick, you could say my life, my, my destiny was pretty planned out. I had to be a runner back in school, which is a lot of pressure when it says Quick right on, on your shirt. I have to be very careful when I'm driving because the worst name to be pulled over when you're for speeding on your driver's license is the name Quick because you're not going to talk your way on that speeding ticket. And I get to do my mission in life, which is teaching people how to learn, remember, focus, read, perform more quickly and efficiently. And uh, this will be my 29th year of teaching and coaching. And, uh, you know, Jim is, uh, when people see me on stages uh, that you and I have, have met and shared is, uh, I do these demos where I memorize 100 people's names or 100 words or numbers people give me. But I always tell people, I don't do this to impress you. I really do this to express to you what's really possible because the truth is you can do this too and so much more. We just weren't taught. And the reason why I know this is possible is I grew up with some pretty severe learning challenges that came from a childhood brain injury, poor focus, poor memory, it took me an extra three years just to learn how to read. I actually taught myself by reading comic books. That's why I had this love for, uh, for superheroes. And uh, when I was nine years old, I remember a teacher pointed to me. I was slowing down the whole class and being teased for it, a little bit of bullied. And a uh, teacher said, that's the boy with the broken brain. And that label of became my limit and I struggled through school. So if anyone has ever struggled in, in anything, you know, was labeled slow or you wondered why this is not fair, you know, my mission really became, you know, from boy with a broken brain to build better, brighter brains, to leave um, no brain left behind is, is our mission. So it's wonderful that, to be here. That, that, that's epic. And you, you kind of already now answered the second question, which is where did it start for you? Where, where did this mission, this mandate, this, this calling, this quest, where, where did it start? but it sounds like it started with the brain injury. Did, did, you, did you ever feel like you would ever have a chance on restoring yourself to normal or getting ahead of the bullying? Um, I mean, I always believed in, in that. And my, 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 my parents immigrated to the United States. Um, my dad was 13. He had um, lost, unfortunately, both his parents and they couldn't afford um, to feed him. He, he moved to the United States to live with his um, aunts. Um, mother grew up in the back of a laundromat that my parents uh, worked at, that she, she, her parents worked at. 
Um, so, but they, they were wonderful role models in terms of working hard, um, being kind. Um, you know, I, I find that the things I was most embarrassed about growing up um, with my learning challenges, I became very fearful of public speaking um, because when you're the kid with a broken brain, your superpower becomes becoming invisible, shrinking down because you don't want to get called on in class. The things I was most embarrassed about, maybe even ashamed of, are the things I'm most proud of today. You know, with a book titled Limitless, it's a very aspiring title, but I believe that these difficult times can define us, these difficult times can diminish us, or these difficult times can develop us ultimately we decide. And so going through my struggles for about a decade and a half, you know, I believe our struggles could be strengths. I mean, my two biggest challenges growing up were learning and public speaking. And the universe has a sense of humor because every single day I get to, to public speak on this thing called learning. And so I think that adversity can become an advantage. And do you ever find that, uh, you know, in all the time that I've spoken to you and in, in, in all the years I've followed you, I have found you to become one of the most eloquent communicators there are. And you come across as someone who's both thoughtful yet provocative, um, who could be both deep but also connected. Do you ever find yourself struggling with anything in the background for you given the injury or the history that you've got that, that interrupts the commitment that you've got in communicating with people? Yeah, it's interesting. In, in my book, Limitless, I have a quote from a French philosopher and he says, life is the C between B and D. Life is C between B and D. B is birth, B is death. C stands for a choice. And we always make these choices. So even, you know, I had three traumatic brain injuries before the age of 12. Um, at, while that was going on, labeled the boy with the broken brain, uh, my primary caregiver was my dad's aunt, who I know me knew as my grandmother. And uh, because my parents were always working, she was my primary caregiver. And when I was having these challenges at five and six, I, she was taking care of me, but then she started to experience early stages of dementia and Alzheimer's. And so when about six or seven, I started to be the one responsible for taking care of her. And when you see somebody that you love and she calls you by your father's name or repeats something that she just said, I don't know if anyone watching this could identify, you know, somebody personally, um, but it's, you know, when I write and I speak about learning language, you know, foreign languages, facts, figures really quickly, it's not just that for your memory. Your memory really is about your life. When people lose their memory, they lose the things, the moment that bind their life together. You know, I think it's very important if your life is worth living, it's worth remembering. It's worth remembering those, those loved ones. It's worth remembering those, those special lessons. And so, you know, even with the book, we donated 100% of the proceeds to uh, women's Alzheimer's research and memory of my grandmother. And also we built schools everywhere. We just did another 50,000 this month uh, for my royalties uh, to Pencils of Promise. We built schools everywhere from Guatemala to Kenya, full schools, teachers, textbooks, healthcare, clean water. And so those are my two passions because I had challenges in both those areas, brain health and education. Is that's, I believe the formula is you learn to earn to return, you know, and contribution is a wonderful way. I mean, investing your time, your talent, your treasure is a wonderful way to get out of the, yourself, you know, especially in a world that's dominated a lot by, by fear and media and news, you know, it, it's the antidote, I think, is service. No, I love that about you. You know, you're always in servitude and to learn, to earn, and to return is, is, is such an eloquent and poetic way to really keep the right battle cry front and center for the things that are important to you. And we're going to get to what's important to you. I know the book was one and we'll get to others. Um, but, but tell me, given the work that you've done and the fact that you've traveled the world, you've, you've, you've adorned many stages, you've, you've worked with celebrities to thought leaders, to icons. I mean, from Sir Richard Branson's, I, I, I mean, there's, we both share an incredible portfolio of, of a great gallery. And this is about you and not me, but that's why I've admired you from my, my perspective. What's the one revelation that you've had in what you're teaching that you wish would be indoctrinated in everyday education worldwide. Mm -hmm. the, the one thing that if they just took that out of limitless, that out of my, uh, the, 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 the quick way of learning the, the, the expertise that I've created or uh, no, no, no thanks to those three brain injuries I've had. You're welcome right. world. What's the one thing you think that we should put into place in everyday academia? Yeah. I have such a love for teachers. Um, my mother became a school teacher because she didn't uh, special education teacher. Uh, because she didn't know how to help me. Um, you know, it's a, for me, it's a system issue. The, uh, the curriculum mostly focuses on what to learn, math, history, science, Spanish. 
Um, but there are not a lot of classes on how to learn. You know, I really think that the most important skill to learn in the 21st century is learning how to learn. That if a genie could grant you any one wish, but only one wish, you would ask for millions of wishes, limitless wishes, right? Well, if I was your learning genie and I could help you master any one subject or any one skill, what would the equivalent be of asking for limitless wishes? It would be learning how to learn. Because if you can learn how to learn, what can you apply that to? Everything, money, marketing, management, Mandarin, martial arts, music, everything in your life gets easier. You know, in a world full of constant rapid change and disruption, the world is changing so quickly. And our ability to focus, our ability to study, our ability to read, process information, remember that information, to critically think, you know, these are the mental superpowers of today's age. And knowledge is not only power today, knowledge is profit. And I read recently that a grad, someone graduating school will have anywhere from eight to 14 different careers. And uh, because the world is changing so rapidly. And so leaning into that skill set, I think that if we could add learning how to learn into today's curriculum, it'll give students, uh, prepare them for a world because we live in an age of, I do train, I've done trainings for SpaceX, you different companies, Google, Facebook. We live in an age of autonomous electric cars spaceships that are going to Mars, but our vehicle of choice often when it comes to education and learning is like a horse and buggy. And it's not a slight against teachers at all. It's just more of a systemic issue. They say if Rip Van Winkle woke up today, you know, the guy that had decades of slumber, if he woke up today, the only thing he would recognize today are classrooms. And so I feel like if there's one thing that I would add to it would be having classes on how to think. Class teaches you what to focus on, what to study, what to read, what to remember, what to think, but not how to focus. You going to your children saying focus or concentrate. It's like going to a child and saying, play the ukulele. For someone who's never taken a class, we've never taken a class called Focus 101. There was never a class called Remembering. I always thought it should have been the fourth R in school, reading, writing, arithmetic, obviously spelling's not one of them. But what about retention? What about recall? What about... Uh, remembering. Socrates says learning is remembering. And so that would, that would be uh, my contribution. I wrote this book. It, the book really is a, a owner's manual for the most important technology. You know, we update our phones, we update our apps more than we update the most important device, which is the human mind. And we've discovered more about the human brain more in the past 10 years than the previous thousand years combined that we found is we're grossly underestimating our own capabilities. And so what if we were born with incredible superpowers, but we're never really shown how to use them? And that's really my mission is to build better, brighter brains. Yeah, I had a massive thought, but I forgot it now, given what you <laughs> I'm totally kidding with you. I'm just, I have another R, raptured. I mean, folks, if you're just dialing in, if you're just tuning in from anywhere around the world, we're here with Jim Quick, uh, the world's leading authority, the most disruptive, innovative, uh, the thought leader on how to really use your brain, use your superpower, author of the most recently uh, released book, Limitless. Uh, Jim, tell me something. Given that we're now in very strange times, some would call it a pandemic. Uh, some would call this an incredible time for, for mankind. Given the crisis and the rising tide of uncertainty, what's, what's the one thing that people should be focusing in on themselves to learn, to expand, to grow, or better for themselves to really come out the, uh, of, the, uh, of the other end better and intact? You know, I really think that the metaphor is that of a butterfly, you know, and while the beauty is in the butterfly, the growth happens in the cocoon and you might feel like you're, you've been cocooning this year, you're physically distancing yourself. Uh, but it's, it's that creature's desire and its will to come out of that cocoon that it builds the strength in its wings to be able to soar to new heights. So we all can make choices while we are cocooning to become a kind of wiser, smarter and, and stronger. One of the choices I talk about these different things, the clarity, wonderful time. Solitude is a wonderful time to self-reflect. And you know, asking yourself, sometimes when you're going a million miles an hour throughout the day, achieving, you don't check in to say, am I going in the right direction? Asking yourself uh, questions like, what's most important to me in my life today, you know, in my, in, in my relationships, in my career, in my impact? And another question to ask, what you distill those values are, are my actions truly aligned with those, those values? Meaning, how many of you feel like, and I love reading the, the chat here, how many of you feel kind of burnt out? And some people say that they feel burnt out because they're doing too much. But often I find that it's not because we're doing too much. Often you feel burnt out because you're doing too little of the things that make you come alive, the things that really light you up, the things that you value the most. 
you know, and I think two of those values for all of us, you know, here it's just feel fulfilled is these growth is, is to be able to develop using this time as, as a way to, uh, to increase our capabilities to learn. You have a to-do list, but you have a to learn list. You know, I believe that a lot of the photos you see with me with, with Bill Gates, you know, and the, these individuals, we bonded over books, you know, the love of reading leaders, leaders are readers, right? And, but what's on your to-do, what's on your to learn list? You know, to be able to expand your, your capabilities. I really think the biggest mistake people are making right now is do not downgrade your dreams to meet this current situation. Do not shrink your dreams to meet this current situation. Instead, upgrade your commitment, upgrade your skills, upgrade your, your competency to be able to meet your dreams, your destiny. No, I love that. I love that. I mean, that's, that's so huge. I mean, one, one of the things I might be, um, I might be letting something out of the box a little bit, but um but I know that one of your dreams and aspirations was to publish a book and it's stellar New York times bestseller. Mm -hmm. I mean, another is, uh, you know, to be a father, to, to, mm -hmm. to, have a, to have a child and tell me if we were to snap a finger, speaking of genies and out comes the, the child of choice and he or she is healthy and blessed and beautiful. Thanks to his mother. You know, you'll tell me what are some of the key things you'll want to teach your child that is so important out of those first critical days, months and years ahead. You know, I'm, I'm curious in the chat, how many of you have children? Hey, put in the chat. How many of you once were a child? <laughs> you put that in the, in the chat. Children mm -hmm. are, are amazing because who are the fastest learners? They're, they're children, right? And the, part of the reason is because they play and they're not fearful of making mistakes. I think the, the thing that I would instill into a child, well, actually speaking of superheroes, um, years ago, I got to introduce two of my like, modern day superheroes over, together over dinner. It was Richard Branson and Stan Lee, not Stan Lee, but Stan Lee, right? The creator of all my favorite superheroes, Avengers and, and Spider-Man and the X-Men. And I, when we're in the car, I ask him, Stan, you created this pantheon of heroes. Um, who, who's your favorite? And he was like, he paused. I was like, yeah, who's, who's your favorite? He said, Jim, it's Iron Man. And I was like, that makes sense. He's like, Jim, who's your favorite superhero? And he has this big uh, Spider-Man tie. And I was like, it's Spider-Man. Without a pause, he goes in his iconic voice, with great power comes great responsibility, right? You've all heard that. You don't even remember when you first heard it. And maybe because I had these, these accidents and I, sometimes I reverse things when I hear it or I read it and uh, I heard something different. I was like, Stan, you're right. With great power comes great responsibility. And the opposite is also true. With great responsibility comes great power. When we take responsibility for something, we have great power to make things better. I actually have, I don't show people this, but on the top of my office, I have this, this actual portrait of Stan Lee and it's made, I was given, it was given to me by Stan and it's completely made, he's a big kid. He's the youngest old person that I, that I knew. And he had two passions. His first passion was his, was his wife. And his second passion was he would still go to work nine to five, Monday through Friday, because he loves storytelling. But he, that, that, that's actually made out of candy because he loves candy also as well. And, um, and, but I do that as to serve as a, a gentle reminder, the power of responsibility that, you know, and that's what I would instill into a child that if, if I could talk to that nine-year-old boy who was struggling all that time, that was being bullied, that was unsure of himself, I would say that you are a hundred percent responsible for your life. You know, your past might have shaped you to who you are, but you're responsible today and moving forward in the future. And I feel like when we claim that ownership, you know, that, that radical ownership, and we have great power to be able to influence it, that ultimately we, all of us here, we are thermostats, we're not thermometers. If you think about the metaphor of a thermometer, a thermometer, what's its only function? thermometer just reacts to the environment. And certainly we react to politics, we react to the economy, we react to how people treat us, the weather. But all the studies done on happiness show that the happiest people, they find the locus, the lo location of control inside, that they are a thermostat. A thermostat doesn't react to the environment. A thermostat engages the environment, right? Intelligently. And then it sets a temperature, just like you set a vision, a goal, you know, a dream, and then the environment reacts to it. So, so we are responsible. And that, that's what I would want to instill in, in my child. I love that, man. And I mean, what a great analogy, what a great metaphor, really, because the thermostat's a, a self governing tool. And it's all about, you know, what temperature you're setting your life at. Um, but it's amazing you talk about Stan because 
you know, this is probably going to be a selfish question as, as I ask for permission to see if, are you open and willing to take calls and questions from anyone around the world here? Are you open to that, Jim? Yeah, I would love to have a conversation. Wonderful. Wonderful. Okay, good. Um, so I've got a couple already lined up, one in from Israel and, and another in from New Jersey. But uh, before I get to them, uh, you know, you occur to me as, as both a superhero and the scripter. I mean, like you could be Spider-Man and the Stan Lee. And in a lot of ways, I think, who would you want to be? Are, are you one writing the story, setting the script, like terraforming the world? Or are you the one really rescuing one brain at a time? Who, who would you rather be? <laughs> this, this, is a, this is a powerful question. I mean, I'm curious to those of you who are, who are on this, listening to this conversation. You know, me growing up as, as with my challenges, I, I was very introverted to begin with, but I also became painfully shy. Post-accident, my, my parents said I was never the same, you know, as a child. That where I was very playful, very energized, very curious, I became very shut down. Uh, because when you feel like you don't have a lot to offer the world, your superpower becomes becoming invisible. It's sitting behind the, the tall kid in class. You don't want the spotlight. And really, I never, if, if somebody else would do this mission, you know, where we're really on, on, on a mission, uh, to build better, brighter brains, it, you know, I would want to support them because it's still a little bit, if I'm honest, a little uncomfortable. While I'm in front of a good 200 to 250,000 people live, you know, in a, in a, in a regular year, uh, three continents maybe in a month, it's still, you know, I still get those butterflies, you know, and because I don't want the spotlight. I mean, ultimately, I think everyone wants to be heard, but I, you know, I really, I feel a moral obligation to do what I do. You know, with our podcast, with our videos, with our online, we have students in 195 nations, um, 300 plus million video views. You know, I, I, I read these stories, Richie, and I just, you know, I, I, I get goosebumps thinking about it. I, I call them truth bumps, you know, but that, that's, really, that's really my, my mission. And so going back, would I want to terraform the, the world? And, you know, a billion dollars doesn't inspire me as much as a billion, one billion brains coming online. That the idea that somebody uh, could be listening to my podcast or watching one of my videos or reaching, reading the ebook uh, in a village somewhere, um, and they be, they learn how to solve problems better or get better uh, connected with their their love of learning, and maybe they solve a big problem like you know they become a malala or they they cure cancer. You know, I really want to democratize and open source this information to the world, and so I feel like that I have a, a foot in, in in each of those roles. That I could be, the, you know, I, I, I want to be able to script and create, you know, mental superheroes around the world. And also, I feel like I am one. I feel like the life we live are the lessons we teach. The life that we live every day, whether it's a parent, you know, as you're, you're an entrepreneur, all the roles that we have, we're always teaching those around us, you know. And I just want to be, I want to be like my, my parents. I want to be a good example uh, of somebody that uh, was, was able to add value, was able to grow, so they had more to give. But I think kindness now is so important. You know, a lot of people are hurting and they're fighting battles that, uh, that, that nobody knows about. And kindness is free, you know, so we should be sprinkling that stuff everywhere. But I feel like that, um, that I, I, I'd like to wear both of those, those roles. Both of those I hats. love it. I love it. So you're, you're Stan Lee in a Spider-Man costume. I got it. I got it. Well, well listen, to sprinkle some of Jim Quick quickly around the world right now. Why don't we head on off to Israel? We've got Noam. Noam, you're live right now with Jim Quick. Why don't you uh, say hello and ask your question? Hi, good night, uh, Mr. Quick. It's, it's the midnight as we speak. Oh, wow. uh, I had a short question. First of all, we really love your work. I've been following you for uh, many years and uh, really enjoying it. I have a short question who, who can help, I think, many of the people on the on the call. Do you have any tip for uh, coaches or uh, teachers how to be able to change the trainees' thinking? I mean, get into their minds in order to to help them with their problems. Into the trainees? In the, to the trainees. The trainees, yeah. You know, getting into people's minds. I think EQ, um, having empathy is, is so important uh, today more than ever. And it, it's interesting because even small little things like um, using using tools and technology start with a, even a book. You know, um, for a long time I read nonfiction books uh, because I wanted to. And all, how many of you buy books? 
Uh, you love to read nonfiction books. And, and how many of you buy books and they sit on your shelf and they become shelf help, not self help? Because I realized that buying a book is different than, than actually reading a book. Um, for me, when I used to go to stores, I, would, oh, I wish I had these shopping carts you know, at bookstores. Um, but actually reading fiction has been shown to actually improve uh, EQ and empathy because storytelling and, and taking on and, uh, other positions and, and roles, that narrative actually makes you more sensitive uh, that character development. So that's why I have such a, an interest in Hollywood and, you know, because it's, it's a nexus of, of storytelling. Uh, another thing is using technology, even like, um, I, I, I was, I'm, I'm very interested in the future of learning. And when you're looking at VR and AR, it, it's interesting because they, I, someone's sharing this experience that um, they put on technology and they were doing fundraising for uh, clean water of all things. And it's something I'm very passionate about because it keeps kids away from school because they're out there getting uh, gallons of water for their, for their village, their home. But uh, they, they put on these VR, um, they wanna get more, elicit more uh, donations. They put on the VR uh, on the uh, protective donors and they got to see 360 view of uh, water coming out for the first time in a village and how happy the parents and the children were playing in there and it created an actual uh, visceral experience for them. You know, I, I gave a talk at the, the 50th anniversary at the United Nations of the land, uh, moon landing and it was all these astronauts and I was talking about moonshot thinking and, and changing beliefs of what's possible and asking you powerful questions. And um, and it was all astronauts and they all shared this experience that uh, they had. It's almost an emotional, spiritual experience that uh, one author calls the overview effect. You know, that when you go outside, you know, in the orbit there, you see the earth and you notice there are no boundaries and we are truly one. And it's, it's that emotional, spiritual kind of experience. They call this overview effect. And, you know, what if you took VR and were able to give that uh, to people, uh, world leaders of impact? You know, to give them, because it's not just logical, it's biological, right? You think about dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, endorphins, we are this chemical soup. And, you know, and so that's a powerful experience. And so these are just a couple of things. And I also think a third thing besides technology is just, just active listening. A lot of people aren't really listening. They're waiting for their turn to speak or they're thinking about how they're going to respond. In fact, when people forget people's names, it's, you know, it's often not a retention issue, it's a paying attention issue. And the art of memory is the art of attention. And for most people, they have this inner voice, so say, thinking about how they're gonna respond. And so my goal here is to show people really what's possible. And it becomes uh, an incredible opportunity for people to see things from different perspectives. And so using those three tools, whether it happens to be books, it happens to be VR, if it happens to be your own ability to ask new questions, come up with new answers. I love it. I love Thank it. Thank you. Thanks, Noam. That was a great question. Great question. I got Vincent Sundar here from Edmonton, Alberta, uh, oil country, probably under a lot of snow right now. Vincent, you got Jim Quick. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Richie. Uh, nice to meet you, Jim. Uh, it's an honor. Um, you know, just listening to you, um, you know, God bless his soul, uh, Stan, uh, you know, he passed away a couple of years ago, but have you ever reflected on what you've said? Um, and, and really, when you say you're, you know, it's not about a billion dollars, it's about affecting a billion people in their minds. Um, really, when you look at it, you're no different than a superhero. Um, and if Stan was around, he'd create you as, uh, as a superhero. Because that's what you're actually doing. You're affecting people's lives. And when you look at, you know, Iron Man or Spider Man, um, you're. It's it, it's kind of weird when you look at a vision and you put it on the board, or you or you read the magazines and you model yourself against some of these superpowers. You're a superpower in itself, and you're affecting so many people. Um, what's the greatest achievement you've had by affecting someone's life? Um, Vincent, uh, thank you. You know, I really believe that these are real mental superpowers, that it's not just about, you know, leaping tall buildings and choosing lasers, shooting lasers out of your eyes, but if I could have a parent have laser focus to be present with their, their child, you know, that's really an accomplishment. And so, you know, we're very fortunate and having done this for 29 years, you know, the highlight of our team's day is, is reading the, the stories that of, of people and it's not just oh i read faster or i'm able to pick up this language or what have you it's 
it's they they believe in themselves again. You know, I had somebody uh, who went through one of our podcast episodes and they they called me up and when I got to the office and they were like, you know, I can't believe I can do this now. Thank you so much for giving me my brain back. And so those little, you know, really for me, I, their success is my success, you know, and it's hard to pinpoint one thing that, that lights you up, but I think nothing really lights you up as much as, as having impact, you know, and so that, that's really how, how we're measuring it right now. And so, you know, every time we have tagged in a great story, you know, from, from children with learning challenges to seniors that are really struggling with their mind to anyone in between, you know, it's hard to differentiate, but those are the kind of things that really light, light my fire. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, buddy. Good stuff, Vincent. Good stuff. I mean, we're on a roll here. I mean, I can't hold back because, Jim, there's a lot of love here for you. There's a lot of respect. I mean, we've got uh, our friends, producers, writers, the creative from Braun in the house. We're giving them some love. Um, but we've got someone who has been using your technology because I want to get into mm -hmm. what does it mean to be limitless? Like, what is it if in the short period of time we've got left to leave people with something to chew on? Um, what is it that you do? I know we've got Catherine here. Uh, what's up, Catherine? Good to hear you. Good to see you. I know you've got a question for Jim because you actually use Jim's approach. You use his principles. You, you, you've you actually in, included into your life and your everyday practice mm -hmm. the very stuff he writes about, he publishes, and he shares around the world. Uh, you're live right now with Jim Quick. Go ahead, Catherine. Okay, thanks. I actually just want to say thank you. Thank you very much for helping me to help my brain wake up following a brain injury it's like you it's not the first time and I just want to say thanks going through your training on Mind Valley it's um yeah it's good stuff thank you thank you congratulations mm -hmm. and and in addition to in addition to your work it, there are certain things that I have found helpful as you were recovering from your brain injury and putting your brain back together. And I appreciate the opportunity, Richard, to, to speak with Jim and to be able to ask, were there any little tricks, little something that um, you you wouldn't consider at first how essential something is. Yeah. 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 You know, I don't think there's a magic pill, like a magic memory pill, but I do believe there's a process um, that some people think of limitless. They think how many of you saw the movie with Bradley Cooper and Robert De Niro, where he takes a pill and he has this incredible focus, it's eidetic memory, he learns all these languages and he has this, you know, incredible drive. But after 24 hours, it kind of disappears. And uh, that's how some people are with their motivation. Uh, that's why we talk about motivation and overcoming procrastination in the book, um, because you want to be able to use these, these skills. But um, Dr. Mark Hyman, who wrote the forward of the book, he's head of uh, innovation at the Cleveland Clinic. And uh, you know, he's like, there is no memory pill, but, uh, but Jim gives you the exact process. There's no genius pill, but this is the genius process. And so for me, it was a... We find that when I, when I do programs at the Cleveland Clinic, the Center for Brain Health, about one third of your memory is predetermined by genetics and biology, but two thirds is completely in your control. You know, and there are things that can really move the needle. Everything from a good brain diet, you know, avocados and blueberries and, you know, walnuts and dark chocolate, because um, what you eat matters, especially for your brain matter, to optimizing your sleep. You know, a little lifestyle hacks, uh, because when you don't sleep, how's your memory the next day? How's your focus? you sleep, you consolidate short to long-term memory, clean up plaque that leads to brain aging challenges like Alzheimer's um, and, you know, things like stress management, you know, these little things. And so I would say that I, it's not just one thing, but it was like a buffet of things and other things affect different people in different ways. You know, exercise is wonderful for the brain. When you move, as your body moves, your brain grooves. You create brain-derived neurotrophic factors, which are like fertilizer for, for our brains. Sometimes it's tough though, you know, when we're often in a screen society and we're always behind screens, we don't take time to move. But as your body moves, your brain grooves. And so exercise is huge. What's good for your heart is good for your head. But everything from that to supplementation, I did some hyperbaric chamber, you know, because oxygen is very important in the healing process. Stress management. How many of you do something for stress? You, uh, you, ha you have some kind of, you get body work done, you do meditation. Chronic stress, we know, shrinks your brain. 
you know, and chronic fear actually suppresses your immune system, makes you more susceptible to colds, the flus, the, the viruses. And so we always have an opportunity to make choices to what we're going to feed our mind. And I would recommend to anyone, no matter your age or stage in life, to be, to stand guard to your mind, you know, to choose the things we all, and also to not only ideas, but individuals, we all need somebody to encourage us, to cheerlead for us, to challenge us, to be kind to us. And if we haven't found that person yet, my advice for one of those people would be, be that person for someone else, you know, especially be that person for, for you. You know, part of self-care and self-love is falling in love with that person in the mirror who's been through so much, but is, uh, but is still standing, you know? And so these are all little choices that we make every single day that can make a big difference. You know, when I'm looking at this, all of you, I see, I see the capes that you wear, right? A superhero is not somebody who just has discovered and developed their superpowers. Uh, you know, that's part of it. You want to discover you're on this journey to, to develop your superpowers, but just having superpowers doesn't make you a superhero. You have to use those powers for what? For good. You know, you have to use your strengths to serve, you know, to make the world a, a better place. And, you know, and so, yeah, I feel like the, 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 some of the things that I rattled off here, you know, I, I created this book and the work of art, you know, like our, the body of work that we have is to be an owner's manual for the most important technology in the world, which is, which is the human mind. And so um, but congratulations, Catherine, on, on all your progress and, and what you're doing and you inspire people around you with your, you know, I do a lot in the TBI space and you know, people have also had strokes and you inspire people around you with your grit and, uh, and your obvious grace. Thank you. Well, listen, man, I mean, you've got a, a huge, huge heart I mean, you, you, you absolutely do, Jim. And what's amazing about that is the fact that uh, I'm here to debunk worldwide the rumor, uh, which has been, I mean, it's, it's, it's probably been hell for you, but you, it, it is untrue that you do not run around the house on weekends in just a cape. It, 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 I'm here to <laughs> it is not. Remember true. when you were a child and you would put on those underoos and you would dress up you know, as a Batman or Wonder Woman, Spider-Man. But Dude, um, I had, I, I had underwear with superhero badges and vectors in my private pouch. I mean, I, I had Superman. I mean, that's going a little bit deep. It is a Friday. We'll keep this PG-13, but all kidding aside, I'm here to debunk the fact that Jim Quick does not run around naked in his house <laughs> with just a cape on. Um, hate the under ruse. That's right, Dr. Al. I see what you just said there. Uh, hey, listen, we got one more here. Uh, we got Kyle Guthrow from Toronto, Ontario. Uh, good dear friend of mine. What's up, Kyle? You got Jim Quick. Awesome. Thanks, Rich. Thanks for coordinating this. Uh, Jim, big accolade to you. First off, I absolutely loved your book so much that I read it twice within a month of itself. And I can't wait to read it for a third time. Kind of a twofold, potentially a threefold question. So my first question is kind of a personal one. What does Jim Quick do to calm his mind when the world gets a little chaotic for you? Is it meditation? Is it relaxing in a quiet room? What, what does that look like? And how often do you do it? Yeah, this is a great, how do you, how do you calm your mind and in a world full of uh, distractions, app notifications, social media alerts, rings, kings, dings. Especially you with know. the image of Jim Quick running around his house in just a cape, my goodness. Like how <laughs> the, thing, the things just pile on, but go on, Jim. Yeah, I, I think it's important to, mm, we well, have a video, has a good 37 million views on Facebook and it just talks about our technology and how it's important every so often to take uh, do a digital detox that sometimes the device that connects us all, it sometimes it rules our world. And we give it that, that we, we give up our sovereignty, we give up our power because of it. You know, that video talks about for the first half an hour, hour a day, don't touch your phone. And I know that ruffles some feathers, but when you wake up in the morning, you are in this relaxed state of awareness. You're very suggestible. But if the first thing you do is pick up your phone, you're rewiring your brain for two things. Number one, distraction every like, share, comment, cat, you know, all those things, it just builds your, it flexes your distraction muscles and you wonder why you don't have peace or focus when you're trying to study or perform. But the other thing it does is it rewires your brain to be reactive. And you know, how many of you have had a message, social media, email message, a voicemail message, and it hijacks your whole day, puts you in the mood, right? And it puts you on the defense. So you're fighting fires and, uh, and you're never gonna have the quality of life that you want, that you desire and deserve if you're just reacting because that makes you a thermometer and i think what we do matters you know if you want to win the day you got to win that first half an hour hour of the day because first you create your habits and your habits create you and i would say 
you know, being conscious of that device because technology is a tool for you to use, but if technology is using you, then who becomes the tool? We become the tool. And so keeping the phone out of the bedroom, I think is important. It's not always easy to do, um, but taking time to get out in nature and not have to be linked to your device, you know? And so I think that's important also as well. And so that's how I kind of detox. I, I, I love the elements. You know, every morning I start with the elements. I, I, I get direct sunlight as soon as I can because that's important for your circadian rhythms. I get, I do my deep breathing and I've done a lot of episodes on our podcast about, about power breathing you know, get that air. You know, I jump in the ocean every single day or an ice cold plunge and I do a cold shower because the, you know, cold is my teacher. It's, it's so amazing. You know, and I get around to some uh, some some heat and some 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 fire and get grounded. Um, and so I think those are the best doctors ever. And it doesn't cost you a penny. Man, I mean, I mean, I'm all in for free, uh, even at a penny. That's cool. I mean, for those who are following along, you, you've got to go to Quick Brain, uh, his podcast. It's stellar. That's number one. Number two is if you haven't grabbed your phone yet, captured some video, uh, post it on IG, get it on Facebook, tweet it out hashtag Jim, let him know, let the movement know, let him understand that you are one of 55 brains of the billion he wants to touch. Let him know this time was important to you. Let him know that it made a difference. Hey, Martin, I know that you're in from a, a part of the world that I don't recall, uh, but why don't you introduce yourself to Jim and uh, let him know where you are and ask your question, please. I see you, Yusuf. Hello, Jim. Uh, I'm Martin. I'm from Sweden, uh, Stockholm, Sweden. And uh, Amazing story. Uh, it's so inspiring that you have co you have converted your weakness into a great strength that you've been able to use to help other people. And uh, I can kind of see where you're coming from, and I see where you are today. What I'm always interested in is uh, to know the the journey in between. And my question is, when did you make this realization that you could use your weakness, you could use what you have learned to make a huge difference in people's lives? And um, when did you see this big project in your mind? Yeah. Was it, yeah, go, that's, go ahead. That's great, Martin, thank you. And thank you also for being awake and, you know, I'm just gonna be, that's amazing, like what a global uh, community this is. My inspiration really was my desperation. You know, I struggled from the age of five to the age of 18. And um, so badly that uh, as a freshman, I was ready to quit school because I thought freshman in college meant you could make a fresh start. And I was clearly wrong because I did worse. And um, I ended up working so hard. I wasn't eating, I wasn't sleeping. I was just living in the library. And one night I ended up passing out late at night and I fell down a flight of stairs in the library and I hit my head again. I woke up in the hospital two days later and at this point, I was down to 117 pounds. I mean, I had lost all this weight. I thought I died. It was the darkest time of my life. And maybe part of me wish I did because I felt like I was a burden and not, you know, enough. And um, I got a little chill of thinking about it. But another part of me woke up also and thought there has to be a better way. And when I had that thought, the nurse came in with a mug of tea. And on it was a picture of Albert Einstein. And a quote from him said, the same level of thinking that has created your problem won't solve your problem. And you ask a new question, you're gonna get a new answer. And I was like, what's my real problem? And it's like, I'm a very slow learner. Well, how do I think differently about it? Well, maybe I can learn how to learn faster. And I put my studies aside. I just started studying positive psychology, adult learning theory, multiple intelligence theory, you know, ancient mnemonics. What did, what did ancient cultures do to remember things before there were smartphones and, and, and printers, right? And about 60 days into it, a light switch flipped on and I just started to get things. I started to be able to focus and retain and understand and apply. And because of it, I couldn't help but help everyone else because, you know, I was like, wow, why wasn't I taught this earlier? This would have been so helpful. And I started to tutor. And one of my very first students, she was a freshman in college, she read 30 books in 30 days, not scam or scan, I got the gist of it, really read it for comprehension. And I wanted to find out not how, I know how, because I taught her, I wanna know why, what was her purpose? And I found out her mother was dying of terminal cancer and the books she was reading were books to save her mom's life. Doctors only gave her mom two months, 60 days to live. And six months later, I get a call from this young lady and she's crying and crying and crying. And when she stops, I find out that they're tears of joy. They're not doctors, you know, that she not only survived, but is really getting better. Doctors don't know how or why, they called it a miracle. But her mother attributed 100% to the great advice she got from her daughter, who learned it from all these books. 
And in that moment, I realized that if knowledge is power, learning is your superpower. And it's a superpower we all have. And what if we were born with this incredible superpower, but we just weren't shown how to use it? Like, what if we were all born with incredible superpowers, but we're not shown, you know, because your brain doesn't come with an owner's manual and it's not user friendly, you know, and that that's the nature of my work, whether it's a book or a podcast or one of our videos or, or coaching programs, you know, I'm kind of agnostic on that. You know, my goal is just to have that impact is building better brains. I mean, if you want a healthy mind, happy mind leads to a happy, happier and healthy home. Right. And, you know, and how do you become limitless? Like the book's limitless. How do you become limitless in a limited world? Exactly what we're doing here. We do, we do it together. Right. And so that's what I'm really excited about. Um, so appreciate, appreciate, appreciate that, that question. My inspiration was my desperation and this will be my mission to the day I, to the day I die. You know, one of the cool things I find about you, Jim, is that there, there's no reverse engineering or codifying what you're saying, because everything you say and how you speak, comes with it, the playbook, comes with it, the know-how, comes with it, the recipe and the formula on doing things. Folks, uh, if you haven't gotten his book, Limitless, uh, it's an absolute read. You've got to check it out. You've got to follow him on podcasts. All his podcasts are amazing. And what I love about what you do, uh, Jim, is that I've often said alongside those that I work alongside of, uh, that proximity is power, but it also unleashes possibilities. And you're always upgrading your game by surrounding yourself with people who are brighter than you. And, uh, and my hat goes off to you. We got the final question coming in from Stuttgart, Germany, uh, from Yusuf. Uh, I know it's pretty late out that way, so I, I've reserved uh, the latest for last. Uh, Yusuf, you've got Jim Quick. All right. Hi, Jim. Hi, Yusuf. Hi. Uh, super interesting, since my background is in sports psychology, so I picked up a few things. But I wanted to add a um, follow-up to, to the previous question. Man, you were we were talking about calming the mind, and then you were talking about taking cold showers and everything. How, do you implement breathing techniques like the Wim Hof method? Yeah. And what do you think of those? So I believe that a lot of people get tired because of just poor breathing. You know, when you're reading, how many of you use reading as a sedative and it puts you to sleep? And part of it is just our posture. We know the lower one third of your lungs absorbs two thirds of the oxygen that the ideal amount of time to study or to work is about 25 to 30 minutes. Um, it's been shown that after that, you know, there's a dip in attention and concentration. And one of the ways to revive that is to, especially when we're on screens all day, I don't know if we're working from home or living at work and, you know, it's just all of this, but taking a five minute brain break to do three things. Number one, to move. As your body moves, your brain grooves, right? But they, they say sitting is a new smoking. You need to be able to move more, not just your exercise, your Pilates, your CrossFit, but just moving throughout the day. The other thing you want to do is hydrate, right? Staying hydrated will boost your reaction time, your thinking speed, 30%. Um, but the third thing to do during that brain break, not only move um, and also breathe, but also, and I practice drink, but also to oxygenate, you know, do that deep breathing. I do alpha breathing. I, I do Wim Hof. I just had Wim Hof on my uh, Instagram live yesterday. We're going to be doing them live next week also as well. And on Tuesday, we're doing a four hour reset your brain to reset your life. And I, you know, and I'm also going to have my, my meditation coach on there as well, you know? And so I do meditate uh, twice a day, 20 minutes. And some people say, I don't have 20 minutes. Your life is so busy. You don't have 20 minutes. You should maybe consider meditating for like an hour, <laughs> but you need sometimes to slow down to be able to speed up, you know, and it's very, very important. So I do breathing every single day. And I also do, I do my, my cold therapy as Wim does also. Also, I met Wim, I showed a photo on my interview with him eight years ago, you know, speaking at an event. Cool. So I've been doing the breathing in the cold for, for that long. Is there a specific time you, uh, that you do it or it doesn't yeah. matter? When, great, great time? question. I mean, for movement, there was a study done at Appalachian State University is for weight management and sleep, you know, getting quality deep sleep. Is a better morning, afternoon, or evening, 7 a.m., 1 p.m., and 7 p.m.? It was 7 a.m., um, and it doesn't have to be your full workout, but for a few minutes, um, they showed that it improves your deep sleep 75%, you know, the movement part. Um, for me, I like to start my day with it. You know, I suffer from pretty severe sleep apnea, where I stop breathing 214 times a night. I talk about it in my book. Um, you know, I have CPAP and you have all these devices and everything, um, but I want to get that oxygen in there, you know, as soon, as soon as possible. So I do that. And then I do a three minute cold plunge, um, you know, and very cold. I, I find that it's important for us to do difficult things first thing in the morning, 
Because if we just do easy things in life, procrastinate, binge watch everything, everything, no judgment. But uh, if you do easy things in life, life gets hard. But if you can train yourself to do the difficult things in life, life gets a whole lot easier. You know, and so cold, I grew up in the Northeast. I don't, I dislike the cold, but I never miss it in a day because for me, it's better than coffee. It's like a nervous system reset. And then also training myself to do difficult things. You know, it shows up later when you have to have difficult conversations or be able to perform and get in, get out of your comfort zone. Limitless is about not, be, not about being perfect. It's about progressing and advancing beyond what you believe is possible. And life's too short. We have one life here and it could be pretty boring if we just live within the constraints and limits of, of what we believe is possible, you know? And so it's not one thing, it, it is everything. I experiment and I document it on social media, you know, for, for people to, to judge for themselves. I think everyone has to find their things. Yeah, cold, cold is a new cool. And if, uh, and if it's cold, it beats being dead. I mean, that's just the reality. But uh, I mean, sure. uh, Yusuf, thanks so much for your question all the way in from Germany. Uh, and for all your questions, folks, all around the world, put some love in there in the chat room. Let, let Jim know just how much we appreciate his time away from his family, away from his calls, away from his podcast and his writing and his researching and all the great things that you're doing. Jim, I'm so uh, proud to call you a friend. I'm so grateful to have met you all those years ago. I mean, what we've learned today is that you converted the spilt fuel from an incident and performed your best personal alchemy. You went from being vulnerable and moved to being invincible and now have inspired and have taught the world how to be invincible too. I mean, you could have stopped at correcting your own course of life. You could have actually easily, easily, by all means necessary, feasted on the joy and the fruits of your labor alone on an island of one, but you knew that wasn't enough. I find you to be one of the most generous human beings I've come to know, and I also know you're just getting started. And that's why I'm totally, absolutely in love with who you are, what you're up to, and what's going to come next. Uh, so from the bottom of my heart, uh, uh, from my home to yours, uh, thank you so much for letting me into your home. Thank you for letting all these folks, letting uh, you into theirs and they into yours. Uh, I'm thankful. I'm grateful. And I know there's going to be a lot more of Jim Quick coming quickly. Uh, so Jim, you be well, you be safe. Uh, remain as sexy as you always are, but continue to do the great work that you're doing, man, because we've got billions more to really elevate and perform the very alchemy that you are a living proof of. Yeah. Yeah. Richie, thank you for the cape that you wear. I appreciate you. I really do believe who you spend time with is who you become. It's not your, just your neurological networks, it's your social networks. And so I want to thank everybody, you know, by association here. Um, we're all on this path to be able to reveal and realize our fullest potential. And just remember that your life is like an egg, that if an egg is broken by an outside force, life ends. But if it's broken by an inside force, life begins. Great things begin on the inside. And everybody here, you have greatness inside of you. You have genius inside of you. And so let, let it shine. Hey, Jim, there, there are so many people here, uh, Chicago, New York. Uh, there are yeah. so many people here from Sweden, from uh, UK who want to ask you things. Could, could we do this another time? Another we time? Would, yeah, yeah I, would, I would enjoy that very much. That would be awesome, man. I, I, I'm just that kind of guy that uh, Braun Studios is giving a thumbs up. You've got uh, digital, creative, unscripted, all giving you a thumbs up. Uh, dude, grateful. Uh, I'm humbled, uh, but I'm also totally stoked at what's going to come next with you. So uh, folks, from around the world, we had Jim Quick, everybody. That's the man. Thank you so much. Pick up Limitless. Follow the podcast. Post him some love. Let him know how much you appreciate him. This has been a courageous conversation with the one and only Jim Quick. Jim, as always, thank you, my friend. Thank you, Richie. Thank you, everyone. Everyone, be well, be great, but more importantly, be limitless. Mm.